Hi Bobcats! In this video, we are going to look at how you can predict what solutes will dissolve in what solvents based on the intermolecular forces that are present in both. Our objective is to explain um, how to predict which solvents are most likely to dissolve a given solute, and we're going to base that on the energetics involved in intermolecular forces. The phrase that chemists use to describe solubilities is like dissolves like. This means that solvents will dissolve solutes that have similar intermolecular forces. For instance, polar solvents will dissolve ionic and polar solutes. Ionic substances and polar substances have permanent charges on them. So if you have permanent charges on your molecules, um, then the solvent and the solute will dissolve in one another. Um, also, hydrogen bonding falls under this heading because hydrogen bonding is like dipole-dipole uh, on steroids. Nonpolar solvents will dissolve in nonpolar solutes. So that means London dispersion forces. Um, London dispersion forces are the result of instantaneous dipoles on a molecule due to the random motion of electrons. So those instantaneous dipoles exist for just a brief moment and then they disappear as the electron distribution goes back to being random. So the bottom line here and how chemists talk about this is we say polar solvents dissolve polar solutes and we lump ionic in with that group and nonpolar solvents will dissolve nonpolar solutes. So let's put these ideas to the test. Let's see if we can determine uh, for each of these three solutes down at the bottom of the page which one of these two solvents, ammonia or hexane, would be the best. Now, when we look at ammonia, ammonia has a central nitrogen surrounded by three hydrogens, and that nitrogen has a lone pair on it as well. This molecule can do hydrogen bonding, right? So hydrogen bonding is the dominant intermolecular force. Since ammonia has hydrogen bonding in it, that involves fixed permanent charges, so we would expect this to be compatible with solutes that have hydrogen bonding, with solutes that are dipole-dipole uh, for their dominant intermolecular force, or with ionic uh, solutes because then the ion-dipole force will come into play. Over on the other side with hexane, that's all carbons and hydrogens. The bonds between one carbon and the next are completely nonpolar, as are the bonds between carbon and hydrogen. So that means that this is a nonpolar substance, and the dominant intermolecular force is London dispersion forces. So since London dispersion forces are the dominant intermolecular force, we would expect hexane to dissolve solutes that have London dispersion forces in them as well. Now the big broad categories that chemists use to describe this, well in the case of ammonia we would call it polar and in the case of hexane we would call it nonpolar. So let's look at these three solutes down at the bottom. CH18, that's known as octane, uh, because it's all carbons and hydrogens. This is going to be London dispersion forces or nonpolar. Being nonpolar, we would expect it to dissolve in hexane. Our next solute is water. Water is hydrogen bonded, so we would expect it to dissolve readily in a hydrogen bonded solute, a uh, solvent such as ammonia. So we would put water over here in this category. It would dissolve most readily in ammonia. And then last but not least, we have calcium chloride. This is a metal plus a nonmetal, which means it's ionic. And being ionic, we would expect it to dissolve in a polar solvent or ammonia. So CaCl2 would go over onto this side. So to summarize, 
calcium chloride and water are most likely to dissolve in ammonia, and octane, CH8, C8H18, is most likely to dissolve in hexane. To take a quick look at the thermodynamics of solution formation, uh, remember what a state function is. A state function is something in thermo like delta H that is path independent. It doesn't matter how we get from our starting point to our ending point. All that matters is that we start in one spot and we end up in another spot. So to try to make arguments about the delta H of forming a solution, um, we draw energy level diagrams like this. So uh, we're starting with the pure solute and solvent at this energy level. And now we imagine a process in which we break apart all of the solute particles. And so that takes energy because we have to overcome their intermolecular forces. So we rise up to this level. And then we also are going to imagine that we're going to break apart all of our solvent particles. And so we have to overcome the energy of all of those um, solvent, solvent intermolecular forces. And that brings us up to this highest energy level at this point. Now, I get it, that's not really how solutions are formed, but let's imagine this hypothetical case because we can generally come up with some numbers um, for these two steps that I just talked about. So if we have now broken apart all of the particles in the solute and all of the particles in the solvent, and now we mix them together, we're going to form new intermolecular attractions between solute particles and solvent particles, and the energy is going to drop down tremendously. And we'll end up at this energy level here, which represents the energy level of the solution. Now, the delta H of this process is going to be the difference between where we started and where we ended up. So this little blue arrow represents delta H. In this case, it's an exothermic process because we end up at a lower energy than we started at, so all of that extra energy has been released. When the formation of a solution is exothermic, the, uh, the energy that's given off will go into the solvent, it'll go into the container holding it, and so you can actually use these exothermic dissolution processes for instant hot packs. You may have used uh, something like this where um, there's a pouch inside of a pouch and you're told to squeeze on it to break the inner pouch and then shake it to mix the things together. Um, and so as that solution is formed, it's exothermic and the the hot pack heats up. It's also possible for delta H to be positive. In that case, instead of ending up at an energy level for the solution that's down here, we would end up at an energy level maybe up here, which is a little bit higher in energy. Let me go ahead and mark that with a pen. So if in the end, the energy level of the solution ends up being something like this, then delta H for the overall process would be positive, and that would be an endothermic reaction. And with that endothermic reaction, um, we would end up with a cold pack because it's going to have to absorb energy from the water and from the surroundings. There's a note down here that while we're doing chapter 13 won't make any sense, that if you're reviewing this for the end of the semester final exam, this will make sense because we're going to do this in the chapter on thermodynamics. Um, generally, solution formation is spontaneous. Uh, we end up with a negative delta G, even in the case of an endothermic uh, reaction process where delta H is positive, because delta S is going to be so large that it forces delta G to be negative.
So we looked a little bit at the energetics involved in the solution process, and we talked about how we can use intermolecular forces to determine what solvent is most likely to dissolve a given solute. The phrase that chemists use is like dissolves like, and what that really boils down to is uh, the nature of the intermolecular forces, and so typically polar dissolves polar, and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar.